So Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man tamasaka bi sunnatihi ila yawmiddin Amma ba'd fa inna astaqal hadithi kalamullah wa khairul hadi hadi Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sharral umuri muhdathatuha wa kulla muhdathatin bid'ah wa kulla bid'atin dalala wa kulla dalalatin fin nar I commence in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most merciful the most kind the most gracious I send salutations and prayers and peace upon the finality of prophets and messengers Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon his family, his companions, and all who follow him in righteousness until the day of judgment. Indeed, beloved brothers and sisters, the best speech is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Qur'an, that Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala has revealed as a source of mercy, as a source of guidance, light, and as a healing for what lies within the hearts and souls of human beings. And the best of that guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the worst of all affairs are newly invented matters in terms of those added to the religion, to the deen, to creed and worship. As every newly invented matter is something that leads humanity astray. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his infinite mercy to protect us from ever being led astray. Ameen. Today, beloved brothers and sisters, as we spoke last week and we talked about finding love through difficulty, through trials and tribulations, this week, inshallah ta'ala, we mentioned how the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had asked for love. He asked for love, inshallah ta'ala. And we want to look at that beautiful hadith, inshallah ta'ala, of him asking for love. And before taking that hadith, we actually want to make a mention, and I think I may have mentioned it last week, inshallah ta'ala, um, but I'm not completely sure. But part of finding that love is making the Qur'an important in our lives. And there was a statement that was made by a man who asked one of uh, the scholars were sheikh and he said how were the companions radwanullahi alayhim when it came to dealing with the quran and the man he responded that the companions radwanullahi alayhim in terms of dealing with the quran were just like you are today with your cell phones the companions radwanullahi alayhim their interaction with the quran was just like you today are with your cell phones. That every free moment that we get, basically we are on our phones. We are on social media, we're sending texts, we're on WhatsApp, we're scrolling left, scrolling right, scrolling up, scrolling down. And that this phone basically has kept our lives so busy. Whether we use it for work, whether we use it for entertainment, whether we use it because we're just filled with boredom, but that it is something that has dominated our lives in this time and era. And he said the companions were like that with the Qur'an, that whenever they had a free moment, that their head was in the Qur'an, that they were reading the Qur'an, they were memorizing the Qur'an, and we know that it wasn't the entire Qur'an because the Qur'an came down over a span of 23 years. But as they would learn the Qur'an, they would write down the Qur'an on different things, on bones, on pieces of leather, right? On these different things or these different resources that they used to write on back in those days. And they would have those verses and those chapters written down and they would go and they would read them and they would memorize them. They would review what it is that they had memorized up to whatever point of revelation uh, they were living in at that moment, inshallah ta'ala, but that their goal was constantly being in the Qur'an. 
And I believe that this is one of the greatest things that we are missing in today's day and time. That many of the human beings, many of the Muslims do not have the Qur'an as that source of light and importance in their life. And I tell you honestly, again, this is, mashallah, a room where we can be open and honest with each other, inshallah ta'ala, because we don't seek praise nor recognition, but we only ask Allah to accept all that we've done and to allow us to do more for His sake. But I can tell you, me personally, 25 years as a Muslim, the last two years has been the most transformational in terms of having a relationship with the Qur'an. Because of our morning readings where we read the English translation of the Qur'an six days a week. And my head wasn't in the Qur'an that much, right? Yes, as a student of knowledge, someone preparing to be an imam, you were, you know, expect, expected to memorize certain amounts of Qur'an as you're studying, mashallah, you're always going through verses of the Qur'an, right? Depending on the different topics and issues that you are studying, inshallah ta'ala. But it wasn't like a consistency of just opening and cracking open the Qur'an and reading the Qur'an like that. And I can tell you that subhanAllah, it's transformational. And subhanAllah, once you begin to have that relationship with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your life is different. The way you see life becomes different, inshallah ta'ala. And I believe that that is the missing ingredient, right? We are so disconnected from the book of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala as a Muslim nation that Subhanallah, it shows in our behavior, it shows in our character, it shows in our practice of Islam and the likes. And, you know, Subhanallah, the companions and the righteous, they were always concerned and focused and looking at, you know, where is my attention, right? There is also a beautiful narration that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, who was known as the fifth caliphate, but he wasn't, but due to his righteousness and his piety, um, he said that he saw a man one time, and the man was making dua. But that while he was making dua, that in his hands were pebbles, and he was playing with these pebbles while he was making dua. And Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, subhanAllah, he says to the man, Ala al hasata wa akhlasta ilallahi ad-du'a. He says, you know, if only you would have thrown down the pebbles, if only you would have relinquished that which was in your hand and made yourself sincere to Allah in the du'a that you were asking. Because he understood in seeing the man that the man was busy with his heart and his mind in two places focused on the pebbles that he was playing with in his hand and then trying to make dua at the same time and Umar ibn Abdul Aziz is basically telling him it would have been better for you to release that distraction from your hands and focused on your dua right and raise your hands to Allah tabarak wa ta'ala focused let your mind your heart and your soul be there when you're asking from the Lord of the worlds and I believe that you know, in many instances, we wonder why our dua may not be answered for many of us. But I believe that's also in many instances, we are making dua while being absent-minded. Right? We may not be present. We may just be asking on the run. And not really sitting down and focused and saying, Ya Allah, this is my situation. Right? This is where I am currently. This is what I am going through. Subhana Rabbil Adeem. This is what I am feeling, right? SubhanAllah, this is what I need. And because of that, SubhanAllah, I believe we remain disconnected and then we struggle. Uh, and we start to struggle because of that disconnection, Subhana Rabbil Adeem, not realizing that we are just so distracted and so disconnected. And the Shaykh, when he looks at this statement made by Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. He says, you know, there has come in our time a new type of pebble, right? A new type of stone that is within the hands of the people most of the time. 
And he says, and the hearts are occupied with this new pebble. It has become a big lump of amusement, of entertainment and play. And their hands are constantly busy with this thing due to its amusement. And he says, and because of it, or due to it, they are not able to stay connected in making dua well. Nor are they able to implore Allah or ask Allah subhanahu or ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says, and it, because of this, it is necessary to say to these individuals, if only you had turned off your cell phones. If only you had turned off your cell phones, right? And made or turned yourself sincerely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in dua. All right? Subhanallah. So we see that the connection of the companions and we see the connection of the righteous that it was always about trying to remove those distractions from their life. You know, I was in the college the other night and I mentioned this narration and I asked the youth, right? SubhanAllah. I said, how many TikTok videos you think you see in an hour, right? Or let's say in, in 10 minutes, right? You see pro possibly anywhere from five, right, to eight videos in 10, in 10 minutes, right? About 40 to 50 videos in about an hour. And what happens is, is that the strategy of it was such, you know what I mean, an amazing strategy that they give it to you just in bites, quick, right? It's, it's a minute and a half. It's anywhere from a minute and a half to three minutes for TikTok. For Instagram, it's only 90 seconds long. Right? So it comes like that and goes like that. So you kind of continue and you scroll and you scroll and you continue and you watch and you scroll and you watch and you scroll. And when you catch yourself and you look at the time you've spent hours just scrolling and watching, scrolling and watching, scrolling and watching, subhanAllah, hours just on the gram and TikTok. Why? And you lose track because it's just one little interesting video at a time. You laugh at this one, this one is deep, you laugh at that one, right? And we can say with certainty that not all of that has anything to do with Islamic content. Every now and then you may run across some Islamic content, right? But for the most part, a lot of it is nonsense, entertainment, stuff to distract the heart, to distract the mind, to keep the soul pulled away from the creator of the heavens and earth. It was a tactic used by shaitan that was genius. But now the believer, believer who is even more so intelligent has to know that, like I asked the youth, I said, imagine that if you used those 10 minutes with the Quran, right? It was just that easy as scrolling five times and you lost 10 minutes of your life. If you use those 10 minutes to read the Qur'an in English, if you use those 10 minutes, mashallah, to memorize a little bit of Qur'an, to memorize a dua, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely from your heart, right? To make istighfar, to do something that is beneficial, to go out and give charity, right? SubhanAllah, to call a brother to make himself feel better, to call a sister to check on her, SubhanAllah, right? Things would be so different in life. But we are so consumed, shaitan has kept us so consumed with this newfound technology that subhanAllah, we find that this new generation, and I think they're calling them Gen Z or Gen something, whatever they call it now, it's after the millennials, right? They are so disconnected that they just prefer to have no interaction with no one. They prefer to sit in a room, be on the computer, be on their phones, and this has become life for them. That is their mode of interaction. They have no social skills, right? And it's sad. It's sad because subhanAllah, you find that you are losing the issue of community. You're losing the issue of brotherhood. You're losing the issue of having good company. You're losing these things because of this distraction, subhanAllah. So we want to remember that subhanAllah, we want to reteach ourselves and re-educate ourselves on how to connect again with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how to remove things so that that connection remains clear just 
at, more intense than the connection we have with the devices that we have purchased, unfortunately. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So he says that these individuals, they should struggle against themselves. They should gather their hearts and their thoughts upon their objectives, meaning Allah is the objective. Jannah is the objective. And what they, what they need. Because all of us need something, wallahi. We all have something that we fall short of the mark with that we need to focus on, that we need to concentrate on. Imagine if you got rid of the distraction and like our brother Michael reminded us this morning in Quran class and we focused on making the 12 sunan a day. Which the Prophet ﷺ said the person who makes those 12 sunan a day, they, a house in paradise will be built for them. Right? What a goal. <laughs> A mansion, a palace in paradise will be built for you if you make it 12 sunan a day, right? If it takes you two minutes to make, you know what I mean, one, two, uh, a two-unit raka'ah, if you have to make 12, that's you divide that by six, inshallah ta'ala, of twos, you know, times two, it took you 12 to 15 minutes in your day to earn that reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How easy Allah has made it, but we find it difficult because we're distracted. I can't wait to run back after the salat to grab my distraction. To dump my head and my heart and my mind into my distraction. Rather than saying, you know what? After my salat, I'm going to stay right here. And I'm going to make those two extra raka'ah, subhanAllah. So that I can go ahead and get that reward. And as he reminded us this morning that before Fajr, the two before Fajr, the Prophet said, it's better than the world and what it contains in it. SubhanAllah. Praying those two sunnah raka'ah before fajr. Better than the world and what it contains in it. But we're distracted, a lot of us, right? SubhanAllah. And this brings us, beloved brothers and sisters, to the dua. And we know that dua is a way to start to remove yourself from the distractions. Right? By first asking Allah, Ya Allah, remove the distractions out of my life and allow me and place within my life barakah in my time. And none of this means, beloved brothers and sisters, that we have to kind of, you know, focus our life completely, 24 hours a day in dhikr, in salah, right? And all of these things. La, right? We just said 15 minutes, you're sunnah. That was 15 minutes out of a 24-hour schedule, right? Subhanallah. A little bit of adhkar in the morning, the morning and the evening adhkar. Hold on to those first, inshallah ta'ala. Takes you five minutes here, five minutes there, inshallah ta'ala, right? We're talking about little actions that produce immense reward, inshallah ta'ala, okay? So, and moving on to the hadith of that beautiful dua that the Prophet sallallahu made. This hadith is a long hadith. And it starts out by saying that the companions, Ridwanullahi alayhim, that they were waiting for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to pray Salatul Fajr. And... The Prophet had not come out to them. And they were in the habit of waiting because they knew that he would come out. Uh, and he came out late. And that when he came out, he prayed the prayer with them, but he made it short <coughs> and quick. Bismillah. And after the prayer finished, he told everyone, remain where you are seated. Don't get up. I want to share with you a dream that I had last night. He says, Last night, I went to pray Qiyamul Layl. And I prayed as much as my heart wanted to pray until I became tired and I fell asleep. And he said, And when I fell asleep, I had a dream that I saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in that dream, Allah jalla wa ala, he asked me, what are the angels arguing about? And he said, I don't know. And he says, Yeah, Muhammad. And the Prophet said, Here I am, O my Lord. He says, What are the angels arguing about? And he says, I don't know. Ya yeah, Allah. And he asked them the third time. And the third time he received, or he told Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the same answer, I don't know. The Prophet Sallallahu then said, I saw him, Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, place his palm between my shoulders. And I felt the coolness of his fingertips between my breast, my chest. 
He says, then immediately everything became clear to me. And I knew in that moment. Excuse me. So Allah says to him, O Muhammad, he وسلم, says, here I am, my Lord. He, Allah Jalla wa ala, says, what are the angels arguing about? The Prophet وسلم, he said, the angels are arguing, arguing about the acts that help to atone, help to purify, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, and what are they? And we have to understand here, beloved brothers and sisters, of our creed. Our creed and our understanding, our aqidah in this point, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not asking the Prophet sallallahu because he doesn't know. Allah is Sami'ul Basirul Alim, right? He is the all hearing, the all seeing, the all knowing. Al Khabir, right? The all aware, right? There is nothing that Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala doesn't know. These are those questions that He asks, well knowing the answer good and well, but so that there are lessons that are derived from this answer, inshaAllah Ta'ala. It's like the teacher who asks the student, you know, how many years was the revelation? Uh, how the many years did it take the revelation to be revealed? Doesn't mean that the teacher doesn't know the answer, right? But he's going to see if he can pull the answer out of the student, inshallah ta'ala, for the benefit, right? SubhanAllah. So the Prophet sallam, when asked, what are these acts that atone? He replied with three beautiful answers. He says, the first is walking to the congregational prayer. And when we look at this and we ask ourselves, how is it that walking to the congregational prayer purifies and atones? We know that the Prophet ﷺ says that the one who walks to the salat, to the masjid, inshallah ta'ala, that with every step that he takes with his right foot, good deeds are added on. And with every step he takes with his left foot, evil deeds and sins are dropped off. Right? SubhanAllah. So these are acts that atone and acts that help the slave and the believer, right? And this is why usually what you tell people, increase your footsteps to the masjid, inshallah ta'ala. Park the car a little bit further away, inshallah ta'ala. And may Allah count all of the miles that you've driven there and the wheels turning on the car, the right wheel and the left wheel, inshallah ta'ala as well. Because of not having the ability, some of us, to live so near or live near to the masjid. He says the second is sitting in the mosque after salah, sitting in the masjid after the salah. And we know that the Prophet ﷺ said that the person who remains seated after the salah and he stays there waiting for the next salah, right? That he is in a state of worship. She is in a state of worship and the angels are making dua for this individual. Those people who stay there to read Qur'an, to make dhikr, inshallah ta'ala, to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until the next prayer comes in. These are acts that atone, mashallah, and purify. He said the third is completing the wudu despite difficulties that one may find in making the wudu. And we know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said about the wudu, that with every drop of water that falls from your hands after making wudu, that those are the sins falling off that you have done with your hand. That with every drop that falls from the eyes, from your eyelashes, those are the sins that you have done with seeing things with your eyes, saying things with your mouth, hearing things with your ears, walking to places with your feet, subhanAllah. The benefit, right, of wudu, subhanAllah, it is a purifier. Not only for the salah, but also for the soul that has, you know, sin within it and errors that we need to get rid of. The beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even more so in difficult moments when it is difficult to make wudu. Perhaps subhanAllah, I remember in the first masjid that I used to be a part of, the wudu station was on the third floor. And this was an old building and we didn't have a door on the roof. So in the winter time, it would be freezing cold and the we didn't have hot water. So the water that would come out of the wudu station, when you would turn it on, you would actually see it steaming, right? Like, But it's because of the cold and not the heat, subhanAllah. And it was kind of like you had to get ready, get your mind right. And when you put your hand under there, 
because it was cold in the room and the water was cold, it would almost like hurt to make wudu, subhanAllah. But it was what we had, right? SubhanAllah. And we loved our facility, subhanAllah, right? Allahu Akbar. The difficulty to please Allah, to prepare yourself for the salah, and then all of the other benefits that come along with that. Allahu Akbar. Then Allah asked him, and what are the acts that elevate? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, feeding others, right? Feeding other people. We're coming to the beautiful month of Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala, the month where we're fasting, and it is encouraged to invite people to come and break their fast in your home, right? To break their fast in your home so that you can have been from those who fed, those who were fasting all day, and be from those who, mashallah, who get the rewards connected to that. Also feeding others who are just the poor and the needy. Right now, there's great opportunities with what's happening in Turkey, subhanAllah. And then around the world, just for Ramadan, in terms of iftar and suhoor, there's people around the world who have nothing. Find yourself a great organization that is doing work and donate money, inshaAllah ta'ala, so that individuals can be fed abroad and also here locally as we have Muslims who suffer here as well. He says, the second act that elevates Allahu Akbar is speaking leniently, softly, right? And this is something that brings love. And it, people, when you talk to them nicely, and mashallah, you speak softly, right? You draw their hearts because of the rifq that you have with them. The Prophet ﷺ said, Inna rifqa la yaqunu fi shayin illa zana, right? That gentleness, when placed inside of something, it beautifies it, right? SubhanAllah. So we see that, you know, being a person of lean, leniency, inshallah ta'ala, it's something that is needed, especially in this day and time. He says, and number three is to make salah at night while the people are asleep. And as we mentioned this morning during the Quran class, that if you are from those who don't think you can get up at half, the halfway point of the night or the third part of the night, then make salah to uh, al-qiyam, after Isha, right? Or right before you go to bed. You can make one raka'ah, you can make three, you can make five, you can make seven, you can make nine, you can make eleven, right? You can do all of this inshallah ta'ala. But the best is those things that you're going to hold on to make it simple. You can do one raka'ah, make witr, one, right? Subhanallah. And then if you get up in the third part of the night and you make it to wake up, alhamdulillah, you can pray in two. So then you have three, five, seven, nine, eleven, right? Allahu Akbar. Because we're only allowed to make one witr in one night. We can't make two witrs in one night, right? Subhanallah. From the deen, from the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But at least you get it done before you go to bed, just in case you don't wake up. Because some of us say, ah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set my alarm. And then... You hit that alarm and you didn't make it the first night. You hit the alarm, you didn't make it the second night. You hit the alarm, you didn't make it the third night. And you could have gotten those you were praying every single night right before you went to bed, inshallah ta'ala. Two minutes. Doesn't have to be long. Qul huwa Allahu ahad. And you make, mashallah, your kunut, your dua in, in the salah. You, salamu alaykum, salamu alaykum, done. Allahu Akbar. And you are written from those who pray at night. All right, subhanAllah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells him, ask. And this is where our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he makes this beautiful dua. He says, ask ya Muhammad. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Allahumma inni as'aluka al-fi'l al-khayrat, wa tarka al-munkarat, wa hubba al-masakeen, wa an taghfira li wa tarhamni. وَإِذَا أَرَدْتَ فِئْنَةً قَوْمٍ فَتَوَفَّنِي غَيْرَ مَفْتُونٍ وَأَسْأَلُكَ حُبُّك حُبَّك وَحُبَّ مَنْ يُحِبُّك وَعَمَلٍ يُقَرِّبُنِي إِلَى حُبِّك الله أكبر So he says in this beautiful dua inshallah ta'ala that we're going to share with you guys in the chat that I suggest you read on a daily basis and you try to memorize he says O oh Allah I ask you to help me to do good deeds. Look at the dua. He commences the dua saying, Ya Allah, allow me to be from those who are involved in the fi'l khayrat, right? The, in those actions that are great, good, loved by you, inshaAllah ta'ala. And then he says, 
And I ask you, Taruk al Munkarat, and to stay away from evil deeds. Keep me away from the evil deeds. Wahub al Masakin. And this is a point, subhanAllah, that I'm sure many of us do not think about ever. He says, And yet, Allah, allow me to love the poor people. Wahub al Masakin. Allow me to love those people who are poor. And we know that behind the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu used to have Ahlu Sufa, right? The people who were impoverished, there were over 70 of them, right? Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, one of the greatest narrators of hadith, used to be back there, live back there, subhanAllah, and spend a lot of time around the Prophet Sallallahu showing us that the Prophet Sallallahu had love for these individuals. But we think about it, and if we contemplate and ponder, and we ask ourselves how many of us ask Allah to wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, ha allow me to love the poor people. Many of us don't even want to interact with the poor people. Many of us don't want to have a connection with the poor people. Many of us, when we see the poor people, we raise our windows, we lock our doors, we become nervous, right? We become judgmental, we say, here comes the drug addict. Here comes the fiend, right? Whether we know that to be true or fallacy, Allah knows best because we don't know the individual. We don't know what drove them to that. We don't know what took them to that point. We don't know what type of trauma they may have went through in their life that, ended, that, that, that caused them to end up in the street homeless and poor. But the Prophet ﷺ was the opposite. Allow me to love them. Because if, Ya Allah, you allow me to love them, then that means that when I see them, I'll serve them. That when I see them, I'll help them. That if I find that there is a need, I am willing to serve that need for those individuals who are poor in need. And the zakat is based on one of the eight pillars of the zakat. A main pillar is to give to the poor and the needy, subhanAllah. Right? And there's a difference between poor and needy in Islam, right? One, subhanAllah, is just meeting the threshold. They, they live at poverty level, maybe $25,000 a year is what poverty level is, and under here in the United States of America and certain states, right? And then those who don't have anything, the needy, means they don't even have that, right? So there's levels to the dynamic, subhanAllah. Allah, allow me to love them, right? right? This is something that we really have to think about and contemplate, you know, and add to our du'as, because those are human beings who need love as well. And then he says, And he says, And that you forgive me, Ya Allah, and you have mercy upon me. And he says, And if you want to tempt a people, Ya Allah, take my soul without being tempted. Ya Allah, if you want to tempt a people, Ya Allah, take my soul without me being tempted because... I don't know if I'm going to pass the test or not. I fear failing the test that may be placed before me. Ya Allah, don't tempt me, please. He says, and I ask you, point number six in this dua. And I ask you that you love me, Ya Allah, and that whomever you love, loves me as well. Right? Because we know that there is no greater love than the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after the love of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala, there is no greater love than those whom Allah loves. Because if Allah loves those individuals, then it means that those individuals are from among the righteous people. It means that those individuals are living correctly. It means that those individuals have special qualities and traits because they have earned the love of Allah. So yeah, Allah surround me with those type of individuals and allow them to love me. As they said, that if you want to change your habits, then place yourself around people that have those habits that you are looking for, because you'll be forced to engage in those types of habits, right? If you want to remove bad habits, look for those who have the habits that you want, surround yourself around them, and eventually you will be just like them. Because they're not going to get involved in the bad habits that you yourself have. Point number seven in this dua, he says, Or I ask you, Ya Allah, that I love you. 
Allow me to love you, Ya Allah. Show my gratefulness and my gratitude to you, my love to you. Allow me to express that to you, Ya Allah, in all of its manifestations and forms. Number eight, and that I love, Ya Allah, whomever you love. Right? And here is another important point that as believers, as brothers and sisters, we are to love each other. Right? This is why he's asking, Ya Allah, whoever you love, allow me to love them as well. The last thing you want to do is not have a good relationship and be in a tit for tat with individuals, with believers whom Allah loves. Right? This is why the Prophet Sallallahu when someone came and they said something to Abu Bakr, he says, leave Abu Bakr alone. Right? Leave my friend alone. Right? He became upset. Subhanallah. Because of the love that he had for Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Right? Subhanallah. This is how we should be with each other. That we have true love. And way too often we don't have that true love because we haven't taken time to know one another. We haven't taken time to be around each other. We haven't taken the time to build on that brotherhood and sisterhood as we know that the Prophet ﷺ said, it is not until you travel. It is not until you break bread. It is not until you do these different things with your brothers that in fact they become your brothers. Right? Because through these difficulties and these hardships, just like our sisters and our brothers who just made Umrah together, mashallah, they build bonds that become bonds for life. Right? Allahu Akbar. And number nine, the last part of this dua, inshallah ta'ala, he says, and I love, and that I love the deeds that will bring me nearer to your love. Allahu Akbar. Allow me to love those things, ya Allah, that are going to bring me nearer to what you love. Right? Those acts in the sunnah, those acts of obedience found in the Quran, those things that subhanAllah, you have told us, ya Allah, that you love for us to do, allow me to love being involved in those deeds. And then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, indeed, this is true, so learn it to understand it. Learn it to understand it. Make this dua on a daily basis, study it, contemplate upon it, and try to add each of these nine components into your life so that you can benefit from them, inshallah ta'ala. And Ibn Kathir, in closing, beloved brothers and sisters, he says, Ibn Kathir, he says, what is significant is not that you love, but what is significant is that you are loved. What is significant is not that you love, but that you be loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because maybe we're not sincere and true in our love. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He loves, it is always 100% sincere and true, subhanAllah. Right? It is a love like no other, as we mentioned earlier. And then there was a companion, Abdullah ibn Yazid al Khatimi, who he made a similar dua to the Prophet Sallallahu dua. And it is also a very beautiful du'a. We're going to conclude with this du'a. And then we'll share the du'a in the chat with all of you, inshallah ta'ala. And if you guys want to go through it, we can go through it a couple of times, inshallah ta'ala, so that you have the pronunciation correctly. This can be one of our tasks for tonight. Totally up to you guys. Um, but he says, Oh Allah, grant me your love. And the love of whomever their love is beneficial for me with you. Right, that surround me of people around people whom their love for me and my love for them is going to be beneficial with you because, mashallah, there are those people that take me to do those things that you love. Oh Allah, and grant me what I love, and let it strengthen me to do what you love. Right, grant me what I love, and let it strengthen me to do what it is that you love, Allah. And he says, and whatever I love, Ya Allah, but that you have kept away from me or you have taken away from me, allow that to be a disengagement of time that becomes free time for me to be used in what you love. Whatever you've taken from me, Ya Allah, 
Maybe I had a relationship with a person and that relationship wasn't no good for me, but I spent a lot of time with that person. You took that and removed it from my life. And now I have this gap of time that is the space of time that is free. Allow me to use that space that you have placed before me. Allow me first to recognize it, then to use that space of time in what you love, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So with that, beloved brothers and sisters, I'm going to end there, inshallah ta'ala. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all of these things and more. Ameen. Jazakum Allah khairan.